Welcome to the good, the bad, and the ugly. Where the mighty are fallen, the good get ugly, and there's no such thing as bad publicity. In this episode, we celebrate the exploits of certain well-known British figures who seem to have a talent for offending people. You have a ridiculous face. Past master at raising hackles, Sasha Baron Cohen first caused public offence in the early 90s with his lewd presentation for Valentine's Day on Windsor TV, for which he got the sack. The character comedian has since gone on to earn as many lawsuits as awards for blindsiding politicians and members of the British public with his outrageously racist and sexist alter egos and tricking celebrities into revealing their own politically incorrect tendencies. There, there are, it is sort of social satire. There are points he's making about racism, about how we interact, that, that you know, you can laugh at it on one level, but there's a whole, there is a smart level going on as well. Sasha, who is himself Jewish, has explained that playing a racist character allows him to lull people into a false sense of security and get them to expose their own racist beliefs. Unfortunately, however, not everyone saw the funny side of a white Jewish Cambridge graduate posing as a suburban chav from Staines who thinks he's black. In 2002, at the London premiere of Ali G in the House, demonstrators turned out to protest the film's racist content. Parading the red carpet in a crown and robes with an entourage of bikini-clad women, Ali didn't flinch. By the way, let me just say to all those brothers outside doing a demonstration, whatever it is that you was protesting against, I is with you, brethren. Yeah. <laughs> Nor was he about to tone down the sexism. Me Julie, I've got to be honest, uh, me knew there was going to be a lot of fit bitches here tonight who was going to be well up for it. So me told me Julie that the premiere is tomorrow night. Uh, she's at home watching these standards as we speak. But... Four years later, he was back in Leicester Square with the release of the mockumentary Borat, Cultural Learnings of America for Make Benefit Glorious Nation of Kazakhstan, he was about to start offending people on a global scale. Well, I have uh, come here with uh, Bilak, my 11-year-old uh, son, his wife and their child, uh, and we are hoping maybe to put uh, maybe some chocolate makeup on the, son's, on the child's face and sell to Madonna. <laughs> uh, I am hoping that Madonna will be a very good father for it. Nothing and no one was spared the spray from the anti-Semitic and sexist Kazakhstani journalist Borat. You have a ridiculous face. Yeah, thank you. Nice. Uh, I want to ask you, what, what tips do you have about being, having such a good reporter? Uh, it is very important uh, to dress uh, handsome, to make sure ladies like you. you must also be uh, well prepared and have other jobs in case you do not have success. I used to be a gypsy catcher and also I was an ice maker. I can make ice and I would also uh, make a uh, spermatozoa release from animals. I can do a camel in 15 minutes. His depiction of the former Soviet Union nation as backward and primitive prompted the government of Kazakhstan to run television advertisements and a four-page spread in the New York Times in an attempt to control its image. Kazakh president Nazarbayev also embarked on a PR trip to New York in the lead-up to the film's release. A Kazakh embassy spokesman also went into damage control. Because still the country is unknown. That's why perhaps he chose Kazakhstan as his uh, fictional home country. But really what he presents is not Kazakhstan, as uh, many people know, it's kind of Boratistan. It's a country of one. I mean, people in their sane minds would probably know that any real country cannot be like what he pre uh, describes in his uh, show. Meanwhile, Sasha staged a faux press conference to capitalize on the free publicity. There are advertisements uh, claiming that we treat uh, women's equally, that all religions are tolerated. Uh, these are disgusting fabrications that have been uh, uh, paid for by uh, enemies of Kazakhstan, evil nitwits Uzbekistan, who, as we know, are very nosy people, and they are using this opportunity to destroy our reputation of my country. But it wasn't just the politicians who were up in arms. The citizens of Kazakhstan were also gunning for him. 
I think he, Borat, should be killed. Our nation is most humane, but he should be killed straight away. If I see him, I will kill him straight away. He is like that and he thinks that others are too, but we are different. We like hunting and behave ourselves. Sasha and fellow producer Jay Roach also faced a $30 million suit from two villagers from Glod in Romania, where some of the Kazakhstan scenes were filmed. They claimed villagers were paid a few dollars each to bring animals into their houses and perform humiliating acts, believing that Sasha was a famous documentary host. However, their $30 million lawsuit was thrown out for being too vague. My movie film have already been released in Kazakhstan and it took uh, the top spot from your Hollywood movie King Kong, which had been the number one film in my country ever since it was released in 1932. Despite the barrage of lawsuits and complaints, Borat remained resolute in his determination to leave no minority unturned in his quest to cause universal offense. I want to uh, say one more time, I have no connection to this Mr. Cohen and I fully support my government's decision to sue this Jew. He, uh, I would like to agree with the statement by Melvin Gibson when he said that the Jews created all the wars. This is not all. We have evidence in Kazakhstan that they were also behind the Hurricane Katrina and were responsible for the end of the dinosaurs. Comedian, columnist and actor Russell Brand doesn't need help from fictional characters to be offensive. He's quite capable of causing major upsets himself. After landing his first presenting role as a VJ on MTV back in 2000, he was fired from the job for turning up to work dressed as Osama bin Laden the day after the 2001 September 11 attacks and for allegedly inviting his drug dealer on set. The self-confessed ex-junkie twerp went on to push more buttons by taking a challenging look at cultural taboos in the documentary Rebrand, co-written with his comedy partner Matt Morgan. He has since carved out a multi-tiered career that along with presenting on TV and radio includes writing a column for The Guardian, acting in movies and doing stand-up comedy. He has also developed a lucrative sideline in presenting award shows, much to the disgust of Bob Geldof, who famously swore at him at the 2006 NME Awards. Russell responded by saying that it was really no surprise that Bob was such an expert on famine, since he'd been dining out on the Boomtown Rats hit I Don't Like Mondays for 30 years. At the Brit Awards the following year, he was under strict instructions from Noel Gallagher to rein in the upstaging remarks. Yeah, I'll just be professional, I think, and like, it's about uh, the band, isn't it, really? Yeah. Uh, Noel Gallagher has already told me in no uncertain terms that if I attempt to overshadow him, he's going to beat me up. He's made it really plain. He said, that, he said it's my night, not your That's what he said to me. So uh, I'll, I'll be making no attempts to upstage the Gallagher brothers. It's, it's about Oasis. By 2008, his notoriety as a host had spread to the US and he was offered the job of hosting the MTV Awards. The VMAs this year is so bloody exciting that it'll make P.T. Barnum look like, oh, he was half-hearted. What do you mean, Tom Thumb, a little fella? That's not interested, a dwarf in a closet. Get yourself together. It will make Don King's hyperbole look ludicrous and understated as I make his hair look tame. For heaven's sake, it's going to be a wonderful day. And guess what, right? We're doing it here on a Paramount lot. We're properly exploiting that. The show's star performer, Christina Aguilera, didn't seem to know quite how to take the self-styled larrikin, who describes his fashion sense as s and Willy Wonka. Hi, how are you? I'm very well. Do you need assistance walking in your spectacular outfit? Um, only by you, yes, yes. For I'm sure. very, very I'll, happy I'll to help assistance. you. assistance. Thank you very Come much. Come into a shaded area, even though your <laughs> beauty creates more light than the sun. <laughs> Christina, it is an absolute honour. You, this is, is this the first time you've appeared in public since you did a baby? Despite offending the Jonas Brothers by mocking their wearing of purity rings and referring to George Bush as that retarded cowboy fellow, Russell later claimed he'd already been invited to host the awards again in 2009, thanks to a viewing spike of more than 20%. 
conceptually it's quite challenging. Russell's Byron Meets Little Boy Lost Meets Trash Bag Act has also helped him lead a charmed life in the ladies' man department. He took out the Sun newspaper's Shagger of the Year Award three years in a row, causing it to be redubbed the Russell Brand Shagger of the Year Award. In late 2008, however, it appeared that all the offensive behaviour had finally caught up with him when he and fellow BBC radio presenter Jonathan Ross decided to leave lewd messages on veteran actor Andrew Sachs' answer phone. The messages alluded to an alleged sexual relationship between Russell and Andrew's granddaughter, Georgina Bailey, who goes by the name of Voluptua as part of a raunchy burlesque dance group. The prank calls were broadcast in October on Russell's national radio show, drawing more than 18,000 complaints, condemnation from the Prime Minister and an investigation by Britain's media regulator. Poor Georgina was beside herself. It's really, really upsetting and I feel awful that my granddad has to go through this. He's 78 years old. Anything that might have happened between Russell and I should have been a private matter and I'm just really distraught that it's been used to upset a harmless, lovely, kind old man like my granddad. Russell and Jonathan apologised to Andrew, who is most famous for playing Spanish waiter Manuel in the 70s comedy Forty Towers. I accept all apologies, but I'm not asking for them. It's not out of my hands, really. While Jonathan copped a 12-week suspension, Russell decided to fall on his sword and resign, giving him more time to focus on his burgeoning film career in the US. Lily Allen's actor-presenter father, Keith, has been quoted as saying of the precocious singer, the one thing my daughter has got from me is the inability to shut up in interviews and things just come out. Things like, I know lots of people that take cocaine three nights a week and get up and go to work every day, no problem at all. That comment in The Word magazine earned her rebukes from British Shadow Home Secretary Dominic Grieve and the head of the National Drug Prevention Alliance, David Haynes. That didn't stop Lily's frankness about the fact that she used to deal drugs as a teenager, but would end up taking more than she sold. She also reportedly dropped her father Keith in it by claiming that he had taken her with him on his drug selling trips to Glastonbury Festival. She was voted the third coolest person of the year by NME magazine in the same year as the BBC rated her the 10th most annoying person on the planet. Love her or hate her, the compulsive blogger who shot to fame through her postings on MySpace knows how to keep people talking about her. Why is we in the spotlight? Why is we centre of attention? Why is we the best at what I was going to be? <laughs> I'm not very good at not being good at something immediately, which is why I wasn't very good at school, because I wasn't getting good grades. Despite admitting that she has a pretty limited range as a singer and songwriter, one thing she excels at is making headlines. Um, I've always been famous in my head. <laughs> uh, no, I don't know. I, got, I went to a gig the other night, I went to see the Yeah Yeah Yeahs play, and I got my, my autograph asked a few times in front of my ex-boyfriend, which was pretty funny because um, it happened a couple of times before that and he didn't believe me and we were standing next to each other and they came up and asked. <laughs> Photos of Lily drunk and topless at the Cannes Film Festival were widely covered in the press, while her appearance at the 2008 Glamour Awards was notable for her so-called massacred Bambi couture and the fact that she stumbled up to the podium completely sloshed. I'm quite drunk. Obviously, if I knew I was going to win this, I wouldn't have been so pissed. Clearly, she wasn't deterred by that embarrassment. At a celebrity-encrusted GQ function in September, she was presenting awards with Elton John, who chastised her for drinking too much champagne. After firing back with an expletive, Lily protested that she was 40 years younger than him and had her whole life ahead of her, to which Sir Elton replied, I could still snort you under the table. She's also been free with her disparaging remarks about other musicians, labelling Sir Bob Geldof a sanctimonious prat 
and stating that everyone who bought Paris Hilton's debut album should be killed. She's taken pops at Amy Winehouse, The Kooks and Kylie Minogue, but recently admitted that her derision of fellow pop stars came from a lack of confidence in her own talent and looks. One fellow musician who hasn't come under fire is veteran Brit pop singer Jarvis Cocker. I kind of knew her a bit when she was young, when she was about nine years old, and she was quite mouthy then. So I know that that's not an act, you know, it's, it's just what she is. But while much of what she is might be obnoxious, Lily has also been using her notoriously big mouth to make some noise on serious issues. A committed environmentalist, her efforts to contact every member of the British Parliament asking them to support an amendment to an energy bill have seen her credited with helping inspire a rebellion against Prime Minister Gordon Brown. She also puts her money where her mouth is on the work front by recording at Europe's only solar-powered studio. As well as admitting to kissing female twins while on a trip to Russia, she's also spoken up on gay rights issues, appearing on the cover of the Gay Times. Another loudmouthed Brit who's fond of making headlines is celebrity cook Gordon Ramsay. The bete noire of the cooking world, his credentials as a chef are beyond compare. He has been awarded a galaxy of Michelin stars and is one of only three chefs in the UK to hold three at the same time. Since starting up his first restaurant, Gordon Ramsay at Royal Hospital Road back in the late 90s, his empire has spread to New York, Dubai and Tokyo. With establishments such as Boxwood Cafe, Foxtrot Oscar and the multi-award winning Petrousse in Mayfair. Every single chef will look after another chef, roll the way right down to the bottom. And that's the way I've, I've always run my kitchen, so that someone's always watching out for someone else. They're a team, they, they work as a team, we cook as a team, and we, we hopefully hit perfection as a team. While he may have achieved perfection in the kitchen, Gordon's style of presentation falls more than a little short in terms of social etiquette. After being ejected from a restaurant by the famously fiery Scotsman, food critic A.A. A. Gill was quoted as saying, Ramsay is a wonderful chef, just a really second-rate human being. Many of his critics believe that the tendency towards hot temper and fondness for swearing he displays in his television shows Kitchen Nightmares and Hell's Kitchen are more suited to the football field than haute cuisine. And if things had gone Gordon's way as a teenager, that is exactly where he would have ended up. On the verge of being signed up for Scottish Premier League Rangers at the age of 18, he suffered injuries to his knee and cruciate ligament that put paid to his professional career. Clearly, however, his focus on kicking goals helped propel him to the top of the ranks in the cooking game, under the guidance of legendary French chef Marco Pierre White. He also used football as an analogy when defending his aggressive mentoring style in his TV shows. If you're watching the game, you know, Sunday night, the soccer is against China and you're losing 2-0 at half-time, it's not going to be, please be so kind to try a little bit harder. Move your we're going to be out of the World Cup. Cooking's the same, it's precious. His comments came at a media event in Sydney, Australia, where members of the Upper House had carried out an inquiry into his swearing urging television networks to upgrade the way they warn viewers of coarse material and deal with viewers' complaints. Gordon was presented with a swearing jar, which he proceeded to drop before letting loose with a barrage of expletives, putting organisers on notice that he wasn't about to start toning it down. Interestingly, however, he claimed he didn't talk like that at home. I, mean, I have four children, my wife is school to each other. It's not the kind of thing we practice at home, swearing at each other. While the four Ramsey children may have been shielded from the obscenity of their father's language, they weren't spared the embarrassment of seeing the face of his alleged mistress of seven years splashed across the front of the News of the World in November 2008. Sarah Simons, author of the book Having an Affair Handbook for the Other Woman, also claimed that Gordon had been involved with at least two other women during his marriage to their mother, Tana.
It can't be easy having fun when you're third in line to the British throne and the eyes of the world are upon you, expecting you to be the perfect model of decency and etiquette. Leading a normal life would have been challenging enough for Prince Harry, growing up in the public eye, the beloved youngest son of the world's most famous woman. But after Diana died, the pressure to fill the gaping void left by the people's princess must have become unbearably intense for a boy of 13. Thankfully, as well as the support of his father, Prince Charles, he had his older brother, William, to lean on. But it is amazing how close we've, we've become, you know, I mean, ever since our mother died, obviously we were close. Um, but he is the one person on this earth who I can actually really, you know, we can talk about anything and we understand each other and we give each other support and everything's fine. But that didn't stop Harry from getting pretty wild in his late teens. Clashes with the paparazzi became commonplace as he was snapped smoking cannabis and drinking underage in pubs. While most of his shenanigans were written off as youthful hijinks, the tide of public opinion turned after the News of the World published a picture of Harry wearing a Nazi Africa Corps uniform to a fancy dress party. Harry immediately apologised, citing the incident as a joke, but the reverberations would be felt in columns and opinion pieces for months to come. As a member of the royal family, Prince Harry could do nothing but keep a stiff upper lip and grin and bear it. On his 21st birthday, he spoke of his frustrations with the press. I suppose that is the media in general. There's, there's truth and there's lies, and unfortunately I can't get the truth across because I don't have my own column in the paper, which I'm thinking about getting. Having learned his lesson, he'd managed to refrain from causing any more public offence forcing the media to restrain their commentary to details of his army exploits and his on-again, off-again relationship with Chelsea Davy. That is, until the news of the world caught him out again in January 2009. This time, the sneaky tabloid had got its hands on a three-year-old video filmed in an airport departure lounge, which featured Harry referring to a Pakistani colleague as our little packy friend. He also reportedly called another cadet who was wearing a headscarf a raghead and mocked the pointless tasks the troops had been given to do. A few days after the video was released, reports emerged that both Harry and his father Charles regularly referred to an Indian friend as Sooty. Once again, Harry immediately apologised and the aptly named Dickie Arbiter went into damage control. Yes, there will be those who will be seriously offended by it, but there will be those who will see it for what it is. British Muslim Council have said, Harry has apologised, we now have to draw a line under it, we have to move on. That's what everybody has to do. After all the strife with the media, perhaps Harry was happy to return with his regiment to Afghanistan and take his chances with the Taliban.